Have you ever looked at the 1993 Super Mario Brothers movie and thought, why doesn't this look anything like Super Mario Brothers? I got a feeling we're not in Brooklyn no more. Nintendo probably thought that too. After all, there are claims they even considered putting it in a vault so that no public eyes would ever see it. It's basically the video game equivalent of Roger Corman's Fantastic Four. It's clobbering time. Up until a few years ago, there was an almost unanimous principle in film discussion online. Video game movies equal bad. If you Google video game movie curse, you'll be hit with thousands of think pieces talking about how every video game adaptation is bad, and an image of Mario Brothers will be front and center. Mario Brothers isn't just held up as the biggest example of the so-called video game movie curse, it's also perhaps the best example of Hollywood don't understand video games. Even one of its many screenwriters, Parker Bennett, once said, there's not a way to take these cute little plumbers jumping over things and make that into anything that would be entertaining. Even when the video game movie genre was in its infancy, it was laughed at. And not just by critics and the movie going public, but by video game fans and commenters as well. They hope that when it opens next month, Mortal Kombat will prove that you can have a film based on a video game that isn't can. Bearing in mind at that point, only three video game movies even existed. It's also perhaps why the first trailer for the Super Mario Bros. movie was so well received by fans. Despite a bit of light mockery around Chris Pratt's performance, All right, that's a go. the general consensus was, well, at least it looks like Super Mario Bros. It has Mario, it has Bowser, it has Toad, Peach, Power Ups, and other things you'd recognize from the games. It certainly looks more like Super Mario Bros. than the 1993 Super Mario Brothers movie did. But maybe we're all being a bit harsh. After all, the 1993 movie is about a man named Mario and his brother Luigi trying to save a princess. But it's also about an underground parallel universe created by a meteorite striking the Earth and causing dinosaurs to evolve into humans who are now ruled over by the evil dictator of Dino Hatton who plans to take over our universe using his de-evolution gun that will devolve us humans back into... <laughs> Monkey. But what if I told you that 1993 Super Mario Brothers wasn't the version of the movie we were supposed to get? What if I told you that we nearly got a version with Mario, Luigi, a princess to rescue, Toad, and the Mushroom Kingdom, along with Koopa's airship, Hammer Bros, Piranha Plants, Magic Hoopers, and other classic references you'd immediately recognize? A movie that was, for all intents and purposes, a big screen version of the Super Mario Brothers video game. Welcome to Cutscene, and this is the story of the perfect Super Mario Brothers movie we never got to see. The year was 1991, and Peter Main, Nintendo of America's Executive Vice President of Sales and Marketing, announced at the Winter Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas that they were going to make a big screen adaptation of Super Mario Bros. due for release the following summer. This would be Nintendo's first title to hit the big screen, but it wasn't their first venture into the movie world. In 1989, Deke had discussions with Nintendo and even announced a live-action movie based on the Super Mario Bros. Super Show. And that same year, Nintendo licensed their product, image, and video games to be featured in Universal's road trip movie, The Wizard, a coming-of-age story about an autistic child who helps his brother run away from home using his video game skills. You're going, boy. California. While not a huge success critically, the New York Times called it a distinct bore, it showed Nintendo that there was something in using movies to advertise their franchises. The Wizard was a 90-minute commercial for Nintendo, the Nintendo Hotline, and the upcoming release of Super Mario Bros. 3. Perhaps most famously, it was a commercial for the Power Glove. I love the Power Glove. It's so bad. Nintendo opened the door for pitches for Super Mario Bros. and major studios and even movie stars like Dustin Hoffman all wanted a piece of that video game pizza pie, pitching million dollar deals to make Super Mario Bros. a reality. But what Nintendo learned from The Wizard is that there is a lack of creative control when working with a major studio. So instead, and perhaps surprisingly, 
Nintendo went with independent producers Roland Joffe and Jake Eberts. One of the things I said was, look, we're not going to do a sweet little lovey-dovey sort of story. It's got to have an edge to it. And given the content that Nintendo was putting out, you might be surprised to hear that that's exactly what they wanted. While Hoffman wasn't successful in his pitch, he still met with Joffe and Eberts to star in the movie, suggesting that Danny DeVito star alongside him with his Rain Man director Barry Levinson behind the camera. Nintendo weren't really keen on this idea though because Hoffman was far too expensive, but it led the producers to meet with another Rain Man connection in Barry Morrow to write his take on a big screen version Super Mario Brothers. Sadly, Morrow's draft doesn't exist online in any shape or form, and that might be because it wasn't actually finished. I had the last scene I was working on when the courier arrived and said, I've been told to take it, whether you're finished or not. Morrow admits that he doesn't remember a lot of the story details, just that the movie was centered around a ring getting lost down a drain, which is what leads Mario and Luigi into a dark dino world to save the princess. Yeah, you're right, that does sound familiar, doesn't it? While we'll never get to read it, future writers of Super Mario Brothers did have thoughts on Morrow's draft. When I read it, I suddenly thought that this was not a movie that someone could possibly have thought was Super Mario Brothers. It bore so much resemblance to Rain Man. Perhaps he thought they'd hired him to do that. Whether Morrow thought that or not, his unfinished script was referred to around the production office as Drain Man. The draft split the producers. Joffe liked it, but Ebers didn't. Fellow producer Fred C. Caruso said that it was more of a serious drama piece as opposed to a fun comedy. Barry Morrow's script was too dark, so the producers veered into the opposite direction. And that's where Jim Genuine and Thomas S. Parker enter our story. Jim Genuine met his writing partner Tom S. Parker while working as a copywriter for an advertising agency. Over a nine-month period, they wrote a script called Terrorvision, described in tone as Evil Dead meets Monty Python, about a suburban couple who are sucked into their television set by a demon from hell and must now survive for 24 hours in order to be released. The story goes that Genuine and Parker got representation based on the script on the Thursday, Terrorvision was sold to Morgan Creek on the Friday, and the writers quit their advertising jobs over the weekend. It's a classic Hollywood story. Terrorvision was rewritten to become 1992 Stay Tuned. The film, which also featured hip hop duo Salt and Pepper, wasn't a box office success, but it did find its fans in some critic circles. The Washington Post called it wonderfully silly. Regardless, the script being sold on spec made Genuine and Parker a hot ticket in Hollywood, and it got them into a room to meet about Super Mario Brothers. By their own admission, neither of them were gamers and hadn't even picked up a SNES pad until they were given a couple of consoles by the producers to get to grips with Super Mario World. We started playing and really kind of fell in love with the characters. There was something charming about Mario and Luigi. So we right away knew that the best way to do this is to essentially have a journey into this world not unlike The Wizard of Oz. But more than just its fantasy world setting, which would look like the games, the pair wanted to have characters that you could believe in. We knew the story had to be about the brothers, and the emotional through line would be about the brothers. Even for a light on its feet comedy, you've got to create a relatable emotional journey. This became the basis for what is now known by fans as the fantasy draft. Our story begins in Brooklyn 20 years ago. A hooded figure drops off a green-eyed baby girl outside a church with a mushroom-shaped ruby locket. That's important for later on. In the present day, we meet our heroes. Two grafting plumbers with thick black mustaches. One short, one tall, one round, one gangly, one grumpy, you get the idea. Right off the bat, their differences are laid bare in a brotherly argument. Mario's in debt to Big Eddie, while Luigi is caught giving money away to the homeless. We quickly learn Luigi is in love with spunky, green-eyed Brooklyn flower girl named Hildy, and that they're both part of a prophecy illustrated by a dream sequence. We see Hildy, a man at her side, Luigi. They smile at each other, in love. Suddenly, Hildy gestures to something in the gutter. It's the ruby locket caught in the torrent. Luigi runs after it and snatches it before it drops into a storm drain. Then, suddenly from the darkness, a reptilian claw reaches out. Hildy! Luigi runs to the alley entrance, and there is nothing. He looks at the ruby locket in his hand, and it disappears. During a slapstick comedy scene where Mario and Luigi botch a plumbing job at a church, Luigi finds a ruby locket that was lost 20 years ago. Spoiler, it's the one he saw in his dream. Luigi sees this as his destiny. Mario, on the other hand, 
immediately tries to pawn it. Across town, Hotspur Hildy meets a tall, powerful, oddly dressed man, something wicked lurking beneath the surface. Enter Cooper, the villain of our story who immediately kidnaps her. Through a convoluted series of events in Hildy's attempted rescue, the brothers Mario hide in a large pipe and, while fighting over the locket, get sucked down deeper and deeper until... Suddenly, we see light at the end of the tunnel and we cut to the open end of the pipe. It sticks out of a grassy meadow. The brothers shoot out of the pipe into the sky and they land in a heap. Our heroes are now in the Mushroom Kingdom and are greeted by a green stalked plant six feet high topped with a bulbous blood red flower and two rows of teeth, a man-eating piranha plant. More video game references come thick and fast as we're introduced to Toad, Cooper's airship, and the fierce-looking half-human Koopa Troopers with turtle-like armored shells on their backs and reptilian features. Mario and Luigi then meet Walton the Wizard, who explains the plot. Koopa plans to marry Hildy and become king of the Mushroom Kingdom and get his hands on the crown of invincibility by casting a love spell which requires Hildy to eat an entire box of chocolates. Sure, why not? There's a bit of business between Walton and a buxom barmaid, which, remarkably, We'll come back later. The following day gives us a bit of action as the Hammer Bros chase Mario, Luigi, and Toad in an Indiana Jones-esque sequence, along with lots of arguments between the brothers whose relationship is starting to fracture. Ending in a comedy scene where an incredibly ugly hag wants Mario to kiss her. Remarkably, this will also come back later. Back at the castle, the love potion is having an effect on Hildy. Hildy's hands are now with longer, sharper, dark green fingernails. Reach into the box for another chocolate. Camera follows the chocolate from the box to her face. Whoa! She's not the sweet young thing we saw before. Back with the brothers and they find a curious egg out of which hatches the wet, slimy head of a newborn brontosaurus-like creature. Its soft eyes gaze at Mario and its 10 foot long red tongue shoots out. This is Yoshi, sorry. Junior? After much toing, froing, arguing, and coopering, Mario and Luigi arrive at the pit of no return to get Walton's wand to reverse the love potion to save Hildy. And you can bet that this pit contains more classic Mario world building elements. The brothers and Toad escape the pit of no return with Walton's wand and a red leaf. But Cooper is waiting for them and 300 style kicks Luigi and Toad back into the pit. This is Mario! Luigi uses the red leaf to get the Tanuki suit to glide to safety and uses a magic bean he was given earlier to escape once again. Mario meets up with Walton, who is struck by lightning and immediately turned to ash. Damn. And Mario heads to Koopa's castle alone. Only he finds that it's just an illusion from a magic Koopa who reveals, sorry Mario, but the princess is in another castle. I understood that reference. The brothers reunite and infiltrate Cooper's castle, and through yet more bizarre circumstances, this script is way too long, they end up singing a song to Cooper at his stag party to avoid capture. Here they find Hildy, a quote-unquote grotesque wench, a hideous hussy wearing a garish gown and heavy makeup, which, to be fair, is the right of every woman on her hen night. The brothers are captured and thrown into the ice prison. Every evening it freezes, Every morning, it melts and is above a pool of razor fish. It's a ticking clock scene where Mario and Luigi have to hash out some of their differences and are eventually saved by Toad. Cooper marries Hildy and gets the crown of invincibility and comes face to face with Mario on a bridge above lava, just like in the games. And Mario tricks Cooper into growing bigger and bigger until he falls into the lava and dies. A luminous butterfly descends and transforms into Walton, who turns out isn't dead. And he reveals that he's actually Hildy's father, who turns out also isn't dead. Not only that, but he proclaims he's now gonna have loads of new heirs to the throne with his new queen, the buxom barmaid from earlier in the script. Told you she'd come back. This also means that Hildy is free to go back to Brooklyn and start her relationship and new life with Luigi. Instead of bestowing our heroes with riches, Walton informs Mario that his heart is richer now than it was before. Mario didn't get money, but he might get a girl, as Hag reappears and kisses him again, this time transforming into a beautiful woman. 
I told you she'd come back as well. Luigi and Hildy get married, Mario pays off Big Eddie, and the closing shot is him opening his heart to the now beautiful former hag who has also journeyed to Brooklyn. We discover they have renamed their plumbing company to Super Mario Brothers. As the camera pans and rises above the Brooklyn street, the street lamps emitting beautiful, magical halos. We wrote our first draft in four weeks and had an amazing time doing it. We handed it in and the producers responded really positively to it. I don't recall there being a huge rewrite involved just to deepen some of the relationships. Essentially what we did was what Shrek did, only we did it before Shrek. We created a faux fairy tale world. So there it is, a Super Mario Brothers strip that is basically the video game writ large upon the silver screen. So where did it go wrong? Joffy and Ebert hired Greg Beeman to direct Super Mario Bros., whose only feature credit at that point was the team comedy vehicle Licensed to Drive featuring Corey Feldman, Corey Haim, and an early performance from Heather Graham. Reviews were generally okay. Ebert's called it more than passable, which is quite the backhanded compliment. But it was enough to get Beeman in front of the producers of Super Mario Bros. And like Jenny and Parker, Beeman thought the best way to do a Mario Bros. movie was to set it in an alternate dimension with a sword and sorcery background that would appeal to kids. In many ways, he was a perfect fit for the genuine Parker script. Super Mario Brothers was quite a step up from an $8 million teen comedy though. The film was currently budgeted to be around $40 million, which was a lot of money in the 90s. Considering Jurassic Park cost around $63 million, this was looking to be a very big production. But Beeman wasn't concerned. After all, he just wrapped sci-fi comedy movie Mum and Dad Save the World so felt he was in the right place to tackle Mario Brothers. He hired SFX specialist Tony Gardner, who he collaborated with on Mum and Dad Save the World, and he got to work on making practical effects like the piranha plants. And while there is no photographic evidence of them online, people have claimed to have seen them. Supposedly they made it too. I've only found a couple of pictures. Oh, man. Just by chance, I got to meet Tony Gardner a couple of weeks ago and he was telling me about it, <laughs> you know? Nice. He, he was very bummed about the project being cancelled because they were, yeah, making all this stuff. Alterian Studios were brought in to put together concept designs for Toe, the Koopa Troopers, Goombas, Thwomps and Baboms, Yoshi and even King Cooper, while Beeman was in discussions with Arnold Schwarzenegger to play the role. There were concepts for sets like the castle where Hildy is being held captive, and this is potentially what the Mushroom Kingdom would have looked like when Mario and Luigi arrive. Those designs for Toad, which are frankly quite nice, nightmarish, were made using the mushrooms from Mum and Dad Save the World as the basis. But it was Mum and Dad Save the World that led to Greg Beeman's exit from Super Mario Brothers. Mum and Dad Save the World cost $14 million to make, but it was a certified box office bomb when it was released, earning less than $1 million on its opening weekend and getting absolutely slated in the press. In both Console Wars and Generation Xbox, it's been asserted that Beeman was fired from Super Mario Brothers because the producers could not get a distributor to finance the movie with a relative unknown direct in the action, with Joffy claiming that Beeman didn't have the stretch for it. Beeman, on the other hand, says it was simply creative differences. One producer had very different ideas from me and how much money should be spent on it. And one had very different ideas about what the tone was going to be. And that's pretty much what led to me leaving the project. However, according to Jim Genuine, it was a private screening of Mum and Dad Save the World that caused Beeman to leave this Super Mario world. They hated it and they fired him. Money was certainly a big contributing factor. The Morrow draft cost around $1 million, Genuine and Parker's script cost money, and Beeman was now spending money on practical effects that were about to go unused, because Beeman's replacement was the final nail in this fantasy coffin. Speaking with the LA Times in 1992, Roland Joffe sheds light on some of his pre-production decisions, admitting, We made some mistakes. We tried various avenues that didn't work. I felt the project was taking a wrong turn. That course correction led them into the arms of British directors Rocky Morton and Annabelle Jankel. Though the pair had done extensive work in the music video world, they were perhaps best known for their alternative sci-fi TV series, Max Headroom. Matter of fact, you might be interested in this the style of the show appealed to Roland Joffe, and when they came in to pitch their version of Super Mario Brothers, it couldn't have been more different to Greg Beeman's 
or indeed Genuine and Parker's fantasy draft. Jankel and Morton wanted to go in a much darker direction akin to Tim Burton's Batman, which brings us back to Joffy's original pitch to Nintendo to give them a Mario movie with more of an edge. Rocky Morton read through Genuine and Parker's draft and thought it was horrible, while Jankel disagreed. It was a wonderful script, but it was more akin to a tone poem about brotherhood than the crazy fun fantasy adventure that I believed it needed to become. Jankel also felt that it was alien from the source material, something that Genuine disagrees with. I thought our take, if you want to talk marketing, was on brand. It was more fun. It had all the darkness that you need for that scope, but it had the light on its feet fanciful humor. But they went in a completely 180 degree direction. So with new directors at the helm and a new vision for the movie, the fantasy draft was thrown out along with the writers themselves and all of Tony Gardner's expensive special effects work. Morton and Jankel's darkly comic tongue-in-cheek sci-fi pastiche pitch is what ultimately became the now infamous 1993 Super Mario Brothers. Parker Bennett, who was brought on with his writing partner Terry Runte to redraft Super Mario Bros., says of the genuine Parker fantasy draft, if you look at the game you go, yeah, that's what you do. It was this sort of Wizard of Oz world and they end up in this world where rocks can talk and inanimate objects are alive. It would have been a lot closer to the spirit of the game, but it would only have appealed to eight-year-olds. It was skewing very young. They did the best they could, but it did skew very young. And the producers wanted to have a bigger opening weekend and have something that would appeal to teenagers and young adults. While Bennett didn't like the script, he added that it did carry value because it told them what doesn't work. But with so much money having already been spent, Bennett and Runty were asked by the producers to use some of the initial framework by Genuine and Parker for their draft, which Bennett argues hamstrings you and then you later have to fight for credit. While the final movie has broad tonal setting and plot differences from the fantasy draft, there are obvious similarities, echoing story beats and character names. Big Eddie becomes Eddie Scarpelli, renamed in the final version to Anthony Scarpelli. Hildy becomes Daisy, still deposited by a hooded figure as a baby. It even compares to Morrow's draft, which features a magical ring central to the plot. Ring becomes necklace, necklace becomes pendant. But even with these similarities, Genuine and Parker's names are nowhere to be found in the credits for Super Mario Brothers. We weren't even arbitrated for credit, but it was so completely different. It seemed pointless for us to try and get credit for something that wasn't like our draft, or for something that we didn't like. Perhaps it was a reaction to the Morrow draft that led Joffy and Ebers to this lighter tone, but it's also counterintuitive to what they and Nintendo wanted to make in the first place. Fred C. Caruso told the LA Times, we were looking for the same audience that enjoyed E.T. as well as Ghostbusters, as well as Terminator 2 and Batman. But when asked about his thoughts on the final product, Genuine called Super Mario Brothers a franchise in search of a movie. From development to screening, 1993 Super Mario Brothers is the first and purest example of the video game movie curse. It leaves you wondering if they'd have filmed the fantasy draft version of the movie, which was closer to the games, would the curse even exist? If Greg Beeman hadn't been fired and they pursued with the Wizard of Oz style story, would the conversation have even begun? In his write-up of the script, smbmovie.com gives a supportive review. The fantasy draft gives us the fullest look at what the film could have been like if it was a more direct, fantastical adaptation. If they had filmed that version of the script, it would have been a classic like Dark Crystal, Willow, or anything in that vein. The reaction to Morrow's Dark Draft is likely what led the producers into this more fantastical world with Genuine and Parker, but it was also counterproductive to what Joffy and Ebert set out to do with their version of Super Mario Brothers. Morton and Jankel's take on the source material was more in line with what the producers wanted. Even if Mum and Dad Save the World hadn't been a colossal failure, there's every chance that Beeman would have been removed because of creative differences. What we do know is that the video game movie curse conversation was sparked because Super Mario Brothers did not look like the source material and was such a critical and commercial failure. It's impossible to know, but video game movies have one thing in common. They all have detailed source material to work from. One of the main criticisms of Street Fighter is that it's not enough like the game, while Mortal Kombat is praised because it is like the game. So what does that tell you? 
It's also possible that the curse has died down to the point of extinction in recent years, thanks to movies like Detective Pikachu and Sonic the Hedgehog getting praise from all sectors and following the highly successful TV adaptation of The Last of Us. At this point in time, there are currently 60 other video game adaptations in development according to IGN, so perhaps the myth has already been busted. But as far as the 90s goes, this is the movie that was made. This is the movie that we got. The fantasy draft might have got more nostalgic affection than the original movie does, even if it did just appeal to eight-year-olds. And there's every chance that if this version had been made, the video game curse might never have kicked off. But even if this version of Mario Brothers had been made, it still would have been killed at the box office. It was released just two weeks before Jurassic Park, which ended up being the biggest movie of 1993. While it may have been more liked or more well-remembered by fans than the movie we eventually got, it likely still would have been the first example of video game movie equals bad. Honestly, releasing a game two weeks before Jurassic Park. Of course it was gonna be big. Directed by Steven Spielberg. It's almost like they wanted it to fail. Whose idea was that? just died. <laughs>